Hi, everybody. Welcome to La Lista, a Latinx writers podcast. I'm your host, Ruben Mendive. And today we have a new guest here. So your name and how you identify. Uh, hi, uh, my name is David Saldana. He, him, my pronouns. Uh, I also like the pronoun dude. Perfect. Too, so I use that one a lot. My follow up is where are you from? And like whatever that means to you. Uh, I'm originally from Austin, Texas. Uh, and I grew up there and uh, lived there into my 20s. So uh, went to elementary school and middle school and high school and even college at the University of Texas mm-hmm. and, uh, and did um, theater there, performance and theater uh, in the community um, for about five years after school. Got it. And I like to get like a sense of people's families. So like, mm-hmm. like what's your parents' story? What's your grandparents' story? Like, what's your history? Yeah, so... Um, I think uh, th- there's a there's a definite subset. I, I don't know what what generation am I. I mean, my parents my parents were born. My dad was born in Austin. My mom was born outside of Austin in a small town called Lockhart, Texas, which it's known for its barbecue. Um, and then their parents were born in Texas as well. And then I think maybe another generation before so it's a, a case as you know uh, that happens in texas where it's uh, we, we didn't cross the border the border crossed us kind of situation and yeah. i think that the, the the furthest south like you know with like 23 and me and stuff the highest concentration of relatives outside of the united states are in like northern mexico and like saltillo which you know there, there was never any like oh we're gonna go visit my great aunt in mexico like that wasn't that wasn't part of my upbringing um, my family was like super suburban like uh and and it's funny because like my dad my dad grew up on the east side of austin he was a self-professed uh pachuco is what they referred to themselves as not a cholo but a pachuco and i think there's a difference i think it's a little more not quite zoot suit but like definitely like the precursor to the cholo so they definitely had the uh you know the white a shirts yeah. uh and uh, khakis pulled up super high and Stacy Adams shoes and stuff. And um, he, uh, you know, he was a neighborhood guy who, who just grew up in the neighborhood and, you know, was part of like a, a little gang, a little crew. I mean, because that's how, I guess how it was. It sounds so old timey, but it, it's true. I mean, before that, he was, I remember driving through downtown Austin. He'd be like, oh, hey, that's where I used to sell the, my, the, my newspapers when I was, you know, 10 years old making making money so they could buy you know candy and comic books and stuff but then also they um when they were young they would have to go in the summer and uh pick like strawberries and stuff in arkansas so they could make their bread their money for for school clothes for the fall and stuff so that was you know and they were like a family that i think was they weren't they weren't poor they grew up in east austin my grandmother worked in like a poultry factory or plant or facility whatever you call it and you know i'm not a a hundred percent sure what my grandfather did i think he 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 labored um and and worked um and i do know that he was um relatively light-skinned so my dad mentioned that because um you know he would go his he would have to go pull his dad out of like the honky tonks and stuff in austin when you know his mother would say you know go go get your dad it's it's dinner time or it's too late or, or whatever like that and uh my dad would tell me stories too about seeing his grandfather on Sixth Street in Austin. I don't know if you know Austin at all. There's this row um, downtown called Sixth Street, which is known for its bars. I mean, mm-hmm. it's it's primarily and particularly um, not. There's East Sixth Street, which is now you know going through the pangs of gentrification. It's primarily the the, the Mexican American side, and then um, um, the other part, which is uh, west of I-35 which, you know, since the 80s has been more a scene for um, college drinking and, and spring break kind of deal in the super party scene. Uh, but he remembers visiting his grandfather, Santos, um, there. And, you know, his grandfather, like, here you go, kid, here's a nickel, like, you know, buy yourself some candy or something like that. So my dad grew up in, in that environment. My mom um, in Lockhart in that smaller town, her, her dad, my grandfather, uh, Ramon Castaneda was his name. And uh, he was um, a mechanic. A mechanic and used car salesman and owned and operated a uh, a um, filling station, you know, kind of whole garage and stuff. And so, like in a small town, that's kind of like a big deal, I think, um, because particularly 
you know, this was, this would have been like the mid fifties, early sixties. So automobiles, not everybody had two cars in, in their garage and stuff. So um, it, my, my mother had like a different car every couple of weeks because they would just come through and they would get sold. So her dad would say like, here, now you can take this one. And she was the oldest too. So she would be like responsible for getting her sisters to school and, and her younger brothers and stuff. And so um, they met through, um, one of the things that, that um, my folks would do, one of the things that you would do when you were young in Texas, in central Texas during that time, is you would go to bailes. You would go to these dances that would be kind of all about, not just in Austin, but they could be like in, they'd be in Lockhart, they'd be in uh, Seguin, they'd be in these different towns in central Texas. Sometimes you'd drive an hour or such to those. And uh, and and that's kind of how, how they met on that scene. And then... Um, after you know they got they got married and and they decided to live in Austin. Um, my dad worked for like um, like a not surfboard a diving board company that that did like um, fiberglass manufacturing. And uh, he 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 was he 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 didn't love that job. I think uh, one of the reasons why is because if you get fiberglass in your in your skin, it's it's you know it's it's a small fiber and it's a fiberglass, so it gets in there and it's it's an irritant and it's really mm. harsh and and difficult and stuff. Um, but he ended up getting a job in the late '60s for IBM, um, and at the time in Austin, um, manufacturing and technology was starting to grow, um, and uh, he was he started in at. On, on, on the floor, as you would say, before this was way before they were making computers, they were making typewriters, IBM Selectric typewriters. Oh, yeah, yeah. And they had like punch cards that would go like, if you ever see any like old time movies from like the 70s or 80s, and they have the computer room, it's like this room with all these tapes and stuff and, and cards. And th that was that was like the technology back then. Anyway, he, um, he was industrious and very Mexican American and upwardly mobile, and you know he would attend classes after um, after work, and you know got a reputation for being dependable and industrious. And they ended up moving him up and moving him up to the point that, like in the uh, early '80s, he made manager. So they, you know, it was one of those companies at the time. It was just in general, right? That was a wonderful time for the American middle class, mm -hmm. and I think a lot of. Um, Latino families, Latinx families really benefited from that because particularly if you were of the, you know, second, third generation, there was that real boon for you to kind of claim, claim your piece of the American dream. And so, um, you know, th that's what he did. And, and he was a company man. And, and he did that. And, and my mom worked the whole time, too. She worked in the area of like office supplies. Uh, she worked for this company called The Office Company. And um, I used to like going there because um, like sometimes she'd have to do some work on the weekends and I'd go in and they had like a, it was like an industrial park and, and they would but they would have pens and paper and like stationery and stuff. And she would always come home with like cool pin stuff and like stamps and, and all sorts of stuff. And that, that was before like the advent of staples and, and they were really meant to serve like a lot of the area medical business stuff. And so, um, you know, my, my, my upbringing was very 1980s, very like latchkey kid, very microwave pizza after school and cartoon. And then like, also was very like disappear out of your house. <laughs> like you come home, you drop off a backpack, you get a snack and then you run down the street and you know, you play, let's jump off the roof at, you know, so-and-so's house. And then you ride bikes and like, it was, it was fun. It was fun. It was fun. And it was of course, very much a thing that I think isn't going to come in that capacity again for for a long time um so that's sort of the that's sort of the scene that i grew up in and um the um you know i was thinking about it too uh, just before you know uh, coming on racially what the sort of dynamic was and um even in in north austin is what is, which is where i was um is very suburban so it was very middle class and but the school the schools i'd say were had at least to my memory had a pretty uh, varied uh, ethnic makeup of, and by, eth by varied ethnic makeup, I mean, black kids, brown kids, and white kids, um, and, uh, and not so many Asian kids, but still some sprinkled in, and then every once in a while, like South Asian kids, but that, you know, that was, that's what you were getting. But I, I just remember that there being kind of a, at least from my memory, a good mix. I, I, I also, I do remember that, um, I think in first or second grade, they bust us across town, uh, to East Austin, to, uh, 
a lower class neighborhood, you know. And to me, even at that age, I was like, hey, I'm brown. Why are you sending me over there? Like, <laughs> like yeah. you, you shouldn't, you, you don't need to send me. I, I'm good. Like, check it out. Check it out. See, it, it's cool. It's cool. Um, mainly, I hated it because it was like an extra hour of bus ride in the morning and in the afternoon. And for like a, a little person you know, for, for grade school, seven, eight years old, that's just terrible. That's just a lot to go with. Um, but um, but yeah, so so that that that's sort of um, what it was like growing up at the, at that time. And then you know, uh, middle school was similar with that sort of makeup as well. Um, I think that by by the time I got in the middle school and the high school, the white kids were in the minority. So it was mainly uh, uh, Latinx kids and and um, and black kids. And I think um, you know, one thing about Austin in that time, or maybe Texas in that time, is when you would identify yourself. When I was a kid, they, if someone asked, if they didn't know already, they'd say, hey, what are you? I'd say, oh, you know, Mexican. And that meant I'm Mexican-American from Texas and that I'm not from yeah. real Mexico. Like, and because and, and, that, um, the real Mexicanos and, and people from Central and South America uh, uh, didn't really start, to my knowledge, visibly moving into the area until maybe the 1990s until that that wave of, of immigration started and so everyone who was there who was brown generally speaking maybe maybe they had people from the valley is what they would refer to and that's like the south texas valley like brownsville mm-hmm. and 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 that area uh, edinburgh and some of the smaller town going towards uh like just south just south so that that was about as like deep as it would get at least within the circles that i ran i'm not saying that those people weren't there at all but when it came to the crowds that 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 my family ran with um that was sort of it you know so kind of a super nuclear kind of suburban little league in the summer um you know water uh water hose fights in the front lawn sort of deal you know watching of course all the the absorbing all the television programming that i could uh, at that time, because in addition to that, like I have a brother and sister who are nine and year nine and eleven years older than I am, and mm-hmm. so by the time by the time my sister got married and and moved out right after high school, and she her husband her ex husband now uh, was in the air force, so she moved away. She moved away, and then my brother was around for a couple more years, and then you know then he 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 got of age, and he was like, all right, bye, I'm out of here. He stayed in Austin, but he wanted to move out and and be on his own as soon as he could. And uh, so I was at, by the time I was like nine or 10, I was the only kid in the house. And so in some ways it's like being an only child because mm-hmm. you get all the resources, you get uh, cable television, you get your own room. <laughs> I didn't have TV in my room, but I, you know, and then I would, I would always get like, you know, spoiled with toys, action figures and stuff like that. And a, a lot of times those action figures, my mom would come home from a garage sale and she would just give me a shoe box that, you know, she would buy the whole box for like five bucks. And then I was like, sweet, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to melt half of these in the backyard with a, with a magnifying glass. Cause that's what little, little dudes do frequently. Um, and, um, you know, so in a lot of respects, it, it was like being an only child, but then on the other hand, since you're not the only child, since you're the accident child, you kind of get not not on purpose because I think my parents were pretty attentive and included me and certainly took me along for anything that I wanted to go along with. But at the same time, uh, you know, you're, you're the first time you do this, the first time you do that, you're you're going into middle school. Th- those o- those occasions just aren't as momentous yeah. because they're like, oh, thank God, you know, like he's going to school. He's, he's, what are we gonna do? Is he gonna ride the bus? So I don't know. Somebody will pick him up or something, and he can ride the bus home. And he's got a key. He's got a key. He's fine. You know. So part of it is the times, and then also the uh, the birth order. Yeah. Uh, as well. Um, is, yeah. Um, you know, I think that's so interesting too because like your childhood and sort of like the story of a lot of like Latinx people that have been here generationally. Um, it's one we don't really get to see that often. I mean, I'm trying to think of like, I feel like maybe like the movie like Selena touched on it a little bit at the beginning, but like there's no, cause like my family were like part of the immigrants that came in the nineties. And I feel like that's sort of where the narrative got popularized. And that's why it's always interesting for me to hear like people that have been here for like ever and like, and live such a like slice of life through like the fifties and sixties that like, is it really part of like pop culture? Yeah, it is. It is interesting. And, 
you know that I think that that representation hasn't even hasn't been there. Um, what before going that direction, I do want to mention too that even even my dad's generation had to deal with this level of acculturation. Uh, you know that they were referred to as pochos, uh, which is you know someone who is of specifically Mexican American, someone who has these roots from Mexico, but doesn't properly speak the language, mm-hmm. doesn't really fit into that. And if you were to have transplanted him and his friends, you know, into Mexico proper, would they would have been just as lost as, as something yeah. from New Jersey. Um, so Spanglish was spoken in my home. And when I was younger, it was definitely part of, uh, of uh, what was going down. Um, my grandmother would take care of us and um, I had a lot of cousins that I would hang out with. So she spoke she spoke English, but she spoke primarily Spanish, particularly with my parents. And I would speak broken Spanish to her. And then, you know, there's just pieces of of the culture that 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 stick with you, of course. Like it's not a flip flop; it's a chancla. It's not tidy whities They're chones. Yeah. Uh, you know, my mom to this day still makes tortillas, uh, flour tortillas. You know, flour tortillas, which is very Texan. I think it's not. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's super like. Like flour tortillas are like what 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 are you talking about you know um, a very but a very Texan thing and um, you know just just sort of things that 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 I think about now but with my kid growing up she's a uh, half Tinex you know my uh, my mom would uh, my mom still refers to white people as Americanos which mm-hmm. is hilarious and my dad makes fun of her he's like what do you mean you're talking about Americans we're all Americans <laughs> like. My dad doesn't talk like that, uh, uh, but uh, he's like, "Hey, Mijo, what's going on?" That—that's my dad. Um, so yeah, I, I had been thinking about that because um, um, it certainly did affect me um, growing up and paying attention to the narratives that I was seeing uh, on screen uh, that I identified more with the Brady Bunch than you know whatever was happening on on telenovelas because yeah. i wouldn't i wouldn't even watch that i would be like no no thank you no thank you like there'd be like a mexican game show and i think it was funny for like two or three minutes or like uh el chavo you know something mm-hmm. like that i was like oh look at that guy okay what's on what's on cinemax like yeah. just right past it um so those those narratives you know it, it wasn't until you got e- even with something like stand and deliver or like la bamba like those were the big like like yeah. those were your movies, right? Those were your movies, and you're like, ah, La Bamba's on. Come on, we're gonna watch La Bamba, <laughs> like again, you know, um, because yeah, that 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 wasn't there, you know, and it and yeah. it's and it's still not there. It's still not there. Um, but I think that um, I think maybe it's not polarized enough, you know. Maybe mm-hmm. it's not outside. It's not far lo- far enough along a spectrum for it to be kind of considered i don't know and so like you you know you sort of talked about like your childhood and i'm always interested in people's like high school years Mm -hmm. um so the prompt is always like who were you who were you pretending to be and how did other people see you high school i really enjoyed coming out of coming out of middle school uh, actually the high school i went to i we lied and gave me a different address because, and, and really the reason why is because the way the school districts were segmented, I was going to go to school with a bunch of kids that I had gone to elementary school with, not a bunch of kids that I had gone to middle school with. And I had made these relationships, these friendships with these people. And I wanted to go to that school and it couldn't happen. And we had a, uh, some family friends who lived in that district and they were like, Oh, you can just use our address. And then that was that simple. I guess it's totally fraudulent and, you know, whatever, but, but it's also, I don't think uncommon. And so I, I, I wanted to go there. Um, and so the, 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 the crowd that I hung out with was, I think kind of sort of preppy ish, I guess, if you will, for lack of a better word, it was the white kids. It was the white kids in middle school, but not just the white kids within those kids were Brown kids and some black kids as well. It was the kids who were in the like honors English class. Got like <laughs> that's the segment. Yeah, yeah. That's the segment. Like, I don't know how to describe it. Cause that's, that's exactly what it was. Yeah. And, and, and it took me a while to find those people too, because I remember in seventh grade being in like a regular English class and I'm not, there must've been some sort of mistake. Um, just just because there is still um and and i'm not going to talk about specifically socioeconomic or or that strata but i think in texas maybe that's that's what i'll say 
just to speak for it. The environment that I saw, a lot of a lot of kids were seemingly adverse to being knowledgeable. Mm. It's like, oh, you study. Like, what's wrong with you? Like, oh, you trying to you trying to impress the teacher? And I, and I think that's to some degree kind of universal. Uh, making fun of the kids who who have the answer. And I remember being afraid to raise my hand because like I, I like th- I've answered three questions already. I'm not going to answer anymore. Like, you know, I wasn't going to get beat up after class, but I was just getting afraid of like getting pointed at and made fun of because when you're 12, that's horrible. You don't want, yeah. you don't need, sometimes you don't even want people looking at you. Um, so go, going into, in the, uh, high school, I was, um, as a band geek, as a band geek and, um, had friends, uh, I made friends with this crew that were like, uh, like skater dudes. I had a couple of, uh, a pair of brothers who were Vietnamese and, and, uh, Vietnamese American and, uh, well, let's see. One of them was born. He was the last one to be born in Saigon. And then his brother, the younger, was in my same grade. He was born in the U.S. And so they, they had all kind of been a crew with, with other kids from from a close-by neighborhood to mine that fed into that high school. Um, so was in band and went through the transition of like wearing... We'll talk about fashion because I think it's important. Uh, there was this, <laughs> there was this uh, aesthetic uh, from in the late '80s into the early '90s of like you would wear um, like a turtleneck. You'd wear a turtleneck with a chain on the outside, and then like a vest. And then there were these pants called there were these there was these two brands. There was Gerbo jeans, and then Cavarucci. And the, the Cavarucci pants were known for like they would come up to like the middle of your chest and they would have like seven se- like you, you could I, I remember having a pair of pants that came with two belts like you were supposed to, it had two belts and you had a higher belt and a lower belt and like i mean at one point the girls were wearing uh like guest jeans but they, they were they they wore uh something called envelope jeans so that like it's imagine if you will the waist went up to this high in a point and then you would fold that over they would mm-hmm. fold that over. And sometimes there would be like a floral design on it. And then all the shoes were pointy. Like everybody had pointy shoes. Like I would have pointy, shiny shoes. And then I would like, I had, I had wonderful hair at the time. I don't so much anymore. But I, uh, at the time, I had like kind of like a, a Mexi fro kind of sort of uh, box to emulate like a lot of my black friends. So I would, and then, uh, and then maybe some sideburns. And so there was a lot of gel in there and a lot of just, you know, there was, there was a lot going on. There was a lot going on. You could, you could like, you could like sit a book on top of my head, on top of my hair and it wouldn't, it wouldn't have, which was just kind of what was, was happening <laughs> at the time, sartorially. Um, and then what happened was, um, I started listening to more like, uh, I guess, rock and roll, you know, and this was all whatever MTV was feeding. I wasn't like, I wish I could say like, oh, yeah, I was like getting into the Austin underground punk scene and going down to the university and combing through records and sneaking into shows. I wish I had done that, but I wasn't that kid. I was like MTV, like, Mm -hmm. but what what music can I buy at Target? And um, so then grunge started happening and then I, you know, started growing my hair out and wearing ripped things. And then in addition to that, and still staying in band, I started playing electric guitar and that became a haven because we would hang out in the band hall after school and play electric guitars and, and rock music in like the smaller band hall and the band direct, we were band geeks as it was anyway so they loved that the kids were there like hanging out for like an hour and a half after mm-hmm. school like playing more music like and i had a buddy who had a bass and he was learning so he 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 would teach me some chords and and teach me some different things and and we already knew some basics in music theory we already knew how to practice we already had developed our ears somewhat when it comes to just like tuning and and listening just some fundamentals and so we we spent a lot of time doing that and while still going to our you know honors classes and um and you know walking or or cramming into a we would cram into whoever had a car like when i was a freshman like I was friends with a couple of people who had older siblings and we would like, like five or six of us would cram into a hatchback hatchback and, and go to Taco Bell for like 59, 69, 79, you know, tacos or whatever. And, you know, as you did in, in high school. And then at a certain point, um, theater became a thing. Mm. And I had, uh, uh, 
always kind of had these tendencies for, I was okay with, I didn't, I guess I was okay with being the center of attention sometimes. And I think a lot of that came from my upbringing, uh, being the little kid who was comfortable with adults. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, when I was younger, my parents would entertain a lot and we'd have, you know, if like two or three, if like two Theos or like a Theo and a Thea showed up and they brought their kids, you're looking at like 20 people in the house, right? (laughs) With just like, just like showing up for like a small affair. Um, So sometimes that meant having an audience, right? And I could like, you know, be in my pajamas walking around with cowboy boots and my Theo's cowboy hat or something like pretending that I'm singing country music or something like that. And it's funny. Or sometimes we would break dance, you know, or something like that for people. So I was okay with having like a spotlight on me because generally I felt like I had a plan. And maybe, maybe because what I would do too is I would also learn like every once in a while I would learn like stand up bits from HBO because I was like eight years old watching HBO without any sort of parental filter and like doing comedy bits back to my dad and getting him to laugh. And so I learned how to kind of develop some or mimic. I don't think I was really had it developed, but I think it was just mimicking comedic timing and kind of knowing how long to stay and then how long to get off the, off the platform. Um, so that was, um, that was a, that's, that was sort of a gateway into, into performance, um, you know, in literal performance into stepping up on the stage and finding out what that was like, because that was something when I was in like seventh and eighth grade, I, I don't think I was, I, I wasn't brave enough to do, but also didn't know that I had permission to do it because as uh, nurturing as my upbringing was, it, it wasn't something that my, my parents were like, like if my kid did that now, I'd be like, okay, I need to get my kid into some sort of like theater group or like some sort of arena where she can express herself and develop that part of her personality. That wasn't a thing for me in my upbringing. It wasn't like, ah, oh, hey, you know, I'm thinking we should send Miho to a to a theater camp this this summer. Like I would have probably loved that, but that just wasn't there. Not because my parents were denying it, but I think just culturally yeah. and generationally, that wasn't a thing that they were going to think of. You know, um, so. Finding that avenue in in high school, I started to get known as a performer. And then the skater dudes that I was hanging out with, they would make like skater videos and stuff, which then transitioned into just like goofy videos, which even transitioned into making like not quite parodies, but almost reiterations of like MC Hammer videos. Mm -hmm. Like they would like re-record like a little skit beforehand and then and then put the CD on because this was all with like a video camera. There wasn't yeah. any editing involved. They would put on like a CD of MC Hammer, and then we would like do the dance routine uh, throughout. And then, <laughs> and then, you know, and that was it. And sometimes it would be for class projects and stuff. So that started building, and then broad- there was a broadcast journalism class that became available uh, at the school. And the young journalism teacher, like the hip. Journal, like 27 year old journalism teacher who was in a rock band decided to start a broadcast uh, broadcast news class and um, I got on that and uh, my buddy was more behind the camera and I liked being in front of the camera and so at a certain point we were being piped in to all the classrooms on Wednesdays and Fridays because at the time in the mid 90s uh, there was this there was a show called Channel One which would give like high school news Mm -hmm. to the high schoolers. And the way they did that is they paid for all these closed circuit television within each room. And then I guess the librarian would play a tape. I guess they'd get a box of tapes for the week or every day or something, or maybe there was feed. I don't know how they did it. And um, they would play those every day. So the infrastructure was already in place. So this teacher said, Hey, why not do something similar, but local school news. So we started doing that and we took it seriously like this became who we were like we were still band geeks i was still a theater geek but then i was also like tv like the news anchor i was like the anchor for the show like i I, um like and we had there was a group of us who were were reporters um my buddy anlo tended to be known as like the outside reporter like the man on the street but he also he also went to like um um, I don't know if you've heard of it, and they recently did a, a show on it uh, about the uh, David Koresh and the Branch 
Davidians, uh, which was this Waco standoff. So there was a, essentially mm. he, he was a religious cult yeah. that he had going on, and they got busted by the ATF for mm. amassing firearms. And it was this raid that turned out to be a whole S show because of everybody that was involved. But my buddy, like the first day after things started happening, he drove from Austin to Waco. And he got on the scene and they got past like sheriff checkpoints because this is before national media got there and before it got into an even bigger deal. And he went and he talked to the news crew, like interviewed them, the news crew who, who were there with the initial raid who had been fired upon with the initial agents who had done the initial raid. So that's how serious we started taking this yeah. stuff. You know, like we're like, oh, we had these cards that said Reagan media because that was our high school, Reagan high school, not not uh, Ronald Reagan, but John H. Reagan, who was a Confederate railroad commissioner, whose I think name has now been expunged for school. I think he's side high now. Um, but at the time was Reagan High School, and um, and we would stay late after school Tuesday nights and Thursday nights. We would like spend the night at school getting our broadcast together because we would. We would shoot during the week. We would shoot after school. Then we'd have to come and edit our stuff after school. And we had two two VCRs and an AV mixer. You know, it wasn't like today where a kid could just do this all on his phone and just yeah. hit send. Like we we thought we were hot stuff for for being able to work. Um, you know these these pieces of equipment that you could buy at Best Buy at the time. <laughs> uh, and and even once one time we even had the mayor on the show because uh, my brother uh, in Austin, he still has involvement with the local and city government. And at the time he was working within city hall and um, he arranged for me to interview the mayor about a new smoking that was going on. And just kind of off the cuff at the end of the interview, I said, Hey, you should come on down and do a broadcast with us at the school. And it was an election year. So he said, yes. Cause I think he thought, you know, some of those kids can vote. Yeah. Uh, and uh, and he came down and he did it and it was great because like we talked about the story we had him on our set he even did like a, a sports segment for us like the soccer team played Johnston High School today uh, yesterday and yada da 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 and he was super nice and and you know we thanked him for coming down and you know our teacher was happy to have him and he left and then uh, <laughs> after the show the principal walked in and he's like hey guys. Uh, I didn't know the mayor was going to be at the school today. It would have been cool if you guys had let me in. You're not in trouble or anything. But, you know, you know, the principal would like to know if the mayor is coming to the show. And we're like, oh, sorry, Mr. Nolly. We didn't think about it. <laughs> um, so that was like – that was that was a lot of the high school experience that I had. It was, it was really – it was really fun and part of having parents who weren't super restrictive like because they knew that this they knew that this was I was this is what I was up to like mm -hmm. he's not home because he's at school like waiting to edit his piece on you know on AIDS research that's happening and how that mm -hmm. affects the kids in in the school um so that that's that that was the identity that I that I was carving out and being part of um a crew of kids who did this and it was it was funny too because we um at the time we would even note it that it was me and uh another latinx kid named anlo who who looked like a he looked like a white guy because his mom was uh anglo americano as my mom would say so he had red hair and freckles and uh, another brown dude named mario and my buddy viet who is Vietnamese and then our friend Humphrey who's black so you know we, we would we would tout ourselves as this like multicultural force like of course we're all male right and like um like uh <laughs> what 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 happened was I remember one day Anlo said no no we're the fantastic four we're the fantastic four you guys you know you guys need to know this and without missing a beat my girlfriend at the time who's still a good friend to this day said you guys aren't the fantastic four you guys are like the fantastic four skins you need to get the hell out of here and she immediately just like brought us down which was great because when you're that age and you know people like you know, people think even on a small scale, like they see you on television and stuff like that. Even if it's just at your high school, you have this visibility and, and you think you're hot shit, but you're not, you know, you're not. And it's good to be reminded that you're not. <laughs> <laughs> it's necessary. It's, it's, it's utterly important to be reminded of that you're just, you know, a goofball like everybody else. Yeah. So, so like sort of coming from that, like high school career, did you, did you have a plan after college? Like, I didn't did you know what you wanted to do. I had no plan. That was the problem. I didn't have a plan. I didn't have a plan. Um, what ended up happening was um, 
it was actually kind of it was it was a, it was actually a really great thing. Um, I got accepted to the University of Texas by Thanksgiving of my senior year, and like I only applied to three colleges. I applied to um, University of Texas, I applied to Boston University, and I applied to U.S. Uh, specifically for their school of journalism. And then I got into University of Texas by Thanksgiving, like kind of early enrollment, and I kind of stopped trying. I stopped caring. I was like, sweet, I'm going to go to UT. That's kind of what I planned anyway, just because I think I had like a smaller worldview because you're in high school. And because my brother had gone to college, he, he had started, but he didn't finish. Um, so my parents still, my parents didn't go to college out of high school at all. My dad actually didn't finish high school until after like he was working and got a GED and then IBM put him through a like an associates for business program and stuff. So he received some education that way. Um, but n there wasn't any sort of college track in mind. My parents didn't talk about a college mm. track either. They didn't also just outright say you're on your own. Sorry, Michal. It was just, it wasn't part of the discussion. Um, and then I ended up getting a scholarship for the University of Texas called the Texas Achievement Award. And so first off, it, at the time, I don't know if this is still the case, but at the time, if you score within the top 10% of your class in high school in Texas, you can get admitted. You were granted admission into the school. Um, and I was, um, I didn't have, I wasn't like a valedictorian, but I definitely had a, a good GPA, um, despite what I did in Mr. Bowen's class in, in, in ninth and 10th grade, ninth grade, yeah, um, <laughs> for failing. I remember I failed one six weeks. That was the first and only time. But um so I, 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 it, it wasn't hard getting in. And then when I filled out my application for the University of Texas, which was a paper application at the time, because it was the 90s, um, I think I checked some box for, do you want to be considered for additional financial scholarship support or whatever? So yeah, sure. Yeah, I'll just check that. I'll just check that. And, um, and so then I was given what was called the Texas Achievement Award, which essentially ended up covering my tuition for the entire four years for the entire four years. It wasn't enough to cover housing and, and additional expenses, but it was it was twenty five grand, I wanna say, which, you know, today is nothing. You know, that's like maybe a year at a cheap school, you know, for like the tuition. Yeah. Um, but, you know, in Austin being in state and, you know, living local, um, it totally covered it. So it was almost like, okay, I guess I'm set. Like I guess this is what I'm gonna do. I didn't do a lot of research into like, okay, if you re like, I knew USC was a good school for journalism. And so I applied for it, at least at the time, that's what I taught, thought. And that's what I was told. And then I applied to Boston University because it was in Boston. And because that seemed like a thing that you do, you go east to school and mm, because yeah. cheers was a thing. And like, you know, there was just this air of like, academic sort of you know, air about it that, that that I have no idea, you know, what the reality is. Um, so I didn't, I didn't do a lot of preparation for it. And there wasn't, and I think that uh, I experienced what a lot of people do, which was that high school was easy academic. It wasn't hard. It didn't test me. It didn't test a lot of us. And I think part of that is because of the spectrum of children that are there and how much has to be covered and how our educators are overburdened and, and you know, even in even in high school, sometimes what they're dealing with are just discipline and personality issues, and some kids not even showing up to school. So when it comes time to turning in assignments and doing that stuff, like for me, that was just I always I would always put things off to the last minute, wing things, and just you know fill things out because of what I had you know heard and what my friends and I had talked about, and you know that was good enough to get A's, not like high A's, not like hard A's, but like you know like ninety two, sweet. 90 awesome 89 i can live with that sweet yeah. let's just 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 keep rolling so it was it was easy it wasn't a challenge which of course became problematic as i got into college and i had to be independent about work and, and study and so you know i went to the university of texas without exploring any further options without without anybody saying to me like that's cool but i think you might you might be more interested in, in these programs or look into this there were there weren't google searches at the time, I mean, the internet did exist, but really you had to go to like, if you wanted to do research on college, you had to go to the office, you had to go to the guidance counselor, you had to go to the college resource room, you had to look on the shelf and pull out these books that were like, you know, top 100 university in the United States and lists of, you know, just, 
it was just more work than than I wanted. I think maybe some kids probably would have been up for it. So I ended up going to the University of Texas and enrolling in, in the track that's referred to as a RTF at the time. I don't know if it's still that, but radio, television, and film. Mm-hmm. And I went to my first RTF class, which was just super, it was in an auditorium, like three or 400 kids. And uh, this guy came up and gave the lecture and like there was plenty of people who weren't even paying attention. And somebody referred to him as like, oh, it's that burnt out radio DJ dude who's talking to us. And uh, it was just so um, high level and so like not involved in any application of any specific sort of theory or practice that I couldn't pay attention to it. Because by this point, you know, in addition to all the high school stuff that we had done for for, for um, reporting, we had started making our own movies. We had started making our own short films. We had started making um, our versions of Lethal Weapon and Reservoir Dogs because, you know, we were teenage boys in Texas, you know, following that narrative that teenage boys do. Uh, and, you know, got to the point that we we got super serious about it and super nerdy about it. And we made our own blood packs. You know, we would, we would, we were, we'd have to go buy condoms or go to like Planned Parenthood and like, like be embarrassed about getting condoms. And then we're filling them with Cairo syrup and, and food dye and then uh, putting, uh, firecrackers behind them to to make them explode and we had pellet guns and we were out in texas and like the creeks and stuff and like super taking ourselves way too seriously and then editing this stuff together and then just showing it to friends like showing it to friends we weren't there weren't even we didn't really know of like any festivals we could submit to and this was pre-streaming on the internet. There was no YouTube. Like mm. if there had been, then then maybe something else would have happened. Uh, but at the time, this is, you know, and like the, the deal was too, is like my parents loved it. My dad loved it. He's like, oh, Mijo, uh, show your Theo that, show your Theo out for blood. Like, you know, and then they would watch it and be like, oh, that's, that's super, that's super awesome. You know, and like, but that was it, you know, that, that was the extent of it. But it was, that was the film school that I went to. That was because we would, I enjoyed being in front of the camera. But I also enjoyed writing and developing the stories and developing the scripts. And, and, it, and it, it started from a point of, um, okay, what are we going to do? I, I don't know. Go over there and try and get him to give you the suitcase without any dialogue. It's just, you know, we would riff. It, it'd be yeah. like an episode of Curbed, right? And, uh, and to the point that then, like, I think, you know, we did like two or three of those. And they, they got more and more serious. And my one friend, Fiat, who's now a, a director in the television industry, he got more and more serious about production at one point he like totaled his car and got the insurance check and instead of getting another car he got a like a high eight dual deck uh editing system that was still Mm -hmm. a linear editing system that had a jog shuttle but it was like just so much more high tech than anything we had in high school and so we he just kept upping his game and and the technological uh piece and so um in the meantime i was just sort of meandering at school academically and the consistent thing that I was taking was uh, French classes, because that's what ended up happening. And uh, and I spent like like I was like, okay, what am I gonna do with this? Okay, maybe I'll. Oh, at, at a certain point, I was like, okay, I'm not even taking film classes anymore. Like maybe I'll just I can be a French teacher. Okay, well, if you want to be a French teacher, you can't just major in French. You basically have to major in like teaching and French. You can't just do one which bummed me out. And I tried for like a semester and I was just like, I'm too far behind on this. I'll just keep doing this, what I'm doing. And then at a certain point I looked down and I'm like, okay, like three more credits and then I have a full-fledged BA in French. So I guess I'm just going to do that, which is what I ended up doing, which is like hilarious because I don't use that at all. I mean, it's helpful to have a college degree, no, no doubt. Yeah. particularly if you go into the corporate world, because that's been a requirement for like, as, as I've gone up that ladder, um, that you have to have a, a college degree. They don't, it's almost like they don't care what it's in, which is good because yeah. mine's in French, you know, and it wasn't until like two years ago that I actually went to France with my family. Um, so, and don't get me wrong though. I think um, <clears throat> the, the reason I stuck with it is because I enjoyed it. You know, my a- education was academic, but I don't think there was any real plan to it. You know, yeah. I would, College was the college age was the worst time for me to be in college. Yeah, because it speaks to a lot of a lot of yeah. people. Yeah, you know, a lot of and, and a lot of 
a lot of young people have a plan for you know and that's amazing and it, and it always amazes me and i think it's great a lot of us didn't though a lot of people don't a lot yeah. of a lot of 45 year olds have still have no plan you know like a lot of 20 year olds have a plan yeah. and it's it, it's it's almost more about the personality than it is about the generation mm -hmm. um, more than anything so um you know we continued making movies and, and getting more serious and every once in a while shooting something i think he shot one thing on 16 millimeter that i was in um but then i started getting involved in the austin theater scene um and there's a, there's a theater company called the vortex repertory company that i got involved in uh that's known for a little more like experimental stuff and known for pushing kind of some narrative boundaries and and offered a little more representation um on the spectrums of sexuality and mm -hmm. uh, different representation in austin uh i think more particularly at the time i think one of the more queer friendly representative uh groups in in tech in austin at the time um but then they still did i mean the the, the reason i went down and auditioned because i wanted to be in a shakespeare play they were doing um macbeth and i and i just wanted to get on stage and and get some more familiarity with that and they also do a children's programming too uh, and would do like summer like a summer kids summer theater thing as well and and so i got involved with that um and became a company member there and it was funny because i remember auditioning for for one of their shows and then i also auditioned for something called the latino comedy project which is still going there's a cat named adrian viegas who's been carrying that on for for decades and uh they're 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 a local latino comedy group that's just been putting on shows for for, for a long time and um i got into that troupe too and I turned them down so that I could go do have this bit part in the Shakespeare play uh, at the other place. And part of me, part of that was like, I didn't feel brown enough mm. to be part of that. And That's I didn't, real. And I didn't feel like my representation, I, I felt like I was, it, w it was just a ticking time bomb until I would be found out as a poser, you know? It's like he's not he's not brown enough. It's like, like uh, I don't do you know this comic named Al Madrigal? Uh, if you do, you do. If you don't, you don't. Doesn't matter. He he talks about doing a gig and like going to like a rodeo gig and like his you know he grew up in the Bay Area and his Spanish isn't very good and like at one point you know he he gets called out by the audience. Somebody just yells like he doesn't even speak Spanish and like like just that that wave of shame. Like I was I was afraid that that was going to come because I didn't feel I didn't feel that I represented that. Mm. And what was funny is that I didn't even know what that was. I didn't even know what, yeah. what I, don't, I was afraid of not being able to represent something that, that I couldn't even articulate. Yeah. And so I just sort of eschewed it and thought, you know, I feel more comfortable with, you know, a hippie, mystical, white people crowd, you know, that's just, that's just all about getting weird, man. Let's just get mm -hmm. weird, you know. That, that seemed to be more in, in my wheelhouse and what I felt comfortable with. Um, and then eventually I got into um, uh, improv comedy in Austin and started doing uh, gigs at this place called the Velveeta Room, which is on Austin 6th Street, and uh, became part of a, a couple of comedy troops there. And for a couple of years, like two years, was doing two shows a night on Friday night and Saturday night for, for a couple of years. So we do a 9 o'clock show and an 11 o'clock show. And then during that time, I was also doing shows for the Vortex Theater um, and... Uh, and so it was great because, you know, I, I was done with school and I was in Austin and I was performing and I was busy and I always had some sort of day job. Like at one point I was working in a textbook publishing company doing photo permission and stuff. So, um, but like my whole mindset was geared towards performing and being on stage and I wasn't really writing as much as, as just performing. But um, what ended up happening was through improv and learning how to uh, craft a scene from the inside, it became apparent that I enjoyed, I enjoyed putting that together. I enjoyed being part of that. And then at the Vortex Theater, I started getting opportunities to do um, other shows, shows that were, there were some were workshops. And so we would put monologues together. And then uh, I made friends with this guy named Clay. And he is like, he, he died a couple of years ago of a heart attack, but um, he was just a super larger than life boisterous guy and he liked me for whatever reason just immediately thought like this guy's this guy's my buddy you're hilarious dude let's hang out and we ended up putting together like this this body clown show he had this character called uncle cuddles and he's like hey you should come up with a character too 
And so for whatever reason, I immediately gravitated towards, okay, well, I'll be Spicky the Clown. Like I'll be this, this lampoon of all the, you know, let Latinx stereotypes. Like my clown suit was a, was a uh, prisoner's jumpsuit and I had a little sombrero and I had cl- full clown makeup on that was like red, white, and green and just totally like lampooning uh, all the representations that, that we get from, from media. And I think part of it was to that. And then part of it was just me thinking that was funny, mm. you know? <laughs> um, and, um, and that carried on for a while. And at and, and one point too, I even joined back up with the Latino comedy project and, and did some, did a couple of shows with them and then rolled out of that. Cause I, I don't think it was, it wasn't quite, it was a little too, um, defined for what I wanted to do. Mm-hmm. And then, uh, and then after a while I burnt out and then after a while I burnt out, I uh, had a relationship breakup. And one of my good friends said to me one day, uh, after rehearsal, she said, um, dude, I don't think, uh, you don't, you don't seem like you're having fun at this anymore. Mm. Like you don't seem to be enjoying what you're doing. And it was funny cause like, I didn't take it defensively at all. Uh, which I think at the time and when you're young and in your twenties or dude, anything anybody tells you, you're automatically going to have this re-jerk reaction to, no, I'm totally loving this. Don't, don't tell me that. I totally was like, yeah, you're right. And, um, so at 27, I left Austin. I left Austin and I moved to the Pacific Northwest. I moved to Portland, Oregon, and I totally dropped out. I totally dropped out and I, I stopped performing and stopped doing comedy and like had a friend who was at Lewis and Clark there and I crashed on her couch for a couple of weeks until I got a job, at Starbucks, and got a cheap apartment downtown and sort of like rediscovered myself, I guess, if you will. Yeah. Um, and wanted to live that it was still that 90s dream that I think I had idolized when I was like 17, 18. There was still that wave of that going on. Although by this time, it's like 2003. So that's like long gone, long gone. It's not even there anymore. It, it, you know, by then it's, it's by, by 2003, it's been supplanted by true, what we refer to as hipster culture yeah. of like really nice coffee and super hip record shops. Um, but I just, I needed to get out. I needed to get out because as wonderful as Austin is and as wonderful as it was for me. And I think it continues to be for a lot of people in terms of a, um, um, a breeding ground for your creativity. It's a place where you can go and you can fail and you can succeed. You can, you can really like, um, try things, try things out and, and not be afraid of like getting pan. Um, because you know, you might be performing in, in, in front of 12 of your best friends anyway. So they're not, they're not going to come at you in the wrong way. Um, they're only going to build you up. But at that same time, I feel like there's only so far you can go there. There's only so far you can go there. And if, if you use it as a springboard to move on, you can do that. And then if not, and I'm sorry if anybody from Austin is listening <laughs> because I love you, but there's also not with everybody. Okay. Not with everybody. If you're listening to this, I'm not talking about you. Uh, but there are certain people who I think become Austin famous, you know, and, and, and then that's kind of where it taps out. And, 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 and that's totally, I think in a lot of ways, egotistical of me to say it, it, it's all about ego. Um, but I think that's part of what we do as performers and part of, of, uh, as writers and creators is, is learning how to reel in your ego but also let it be out sometimes you have mm-hmm. to lead with that sometimes because i think that's where a lot of our art comes from uh so portland you know i had a bicycle i slung coffee you know smoked some weed uh and then i started training capoeira uh which is brazilian martial arts which i've been doing since 2003 and i'm now a, a professor of mm-hmm. and and teach in in LA and and up into the pandemic was teaching locally uh, community classes. Uh, But that's just something that I've, that I've been doing then since then it became my performance surrogate Mm -hmm. and I'd always wanted to train martial arts. And part of moving to uh, Portland was, was actually getting a lot healthier because I was very overweight and in Texas. And if you're in Texas and you're Latino, like it's just food, it's like 24 seven food and everything's covered in cheese. It's just like meat covered in cheese in a tortilla. Like, with parsley on the side like like that's it like and so you know my my lifestyle got healthier um my worldview changed a little bit my scenery changed you know being being surrounded by evergreens and gray skies was wonderful um and then it didn't take too long before before i started feeling the itch to um to be creative and i spent a lot of time at powell's bookstores a pal's bookstore reading um just different books on on writing and, and um 
performance and, and uh, just kind of how that how you build that because I think the piece the piece that was really missing for me was discipline. It was easy for me to be creative on stage and improvisationally because the lights are on and no one's expecting you to be prepared. You don't have to memorize any lines. You build a scene from within. But when it comes to to actually structuring something and actually putting something together with forethought and with a plan, uh, then that's hard. Uh, Capoeira helped me with that because it is a martial art and it, and it, like anything, like anything, you don't get results in two sessions. You have to yeah. go for a year before you see even like anything happen. So learning, learning how to do that and, and getting more regimented, uh, which was really hard for me because I was not regimented at all. Yeah. And so um, that helped, that helped. And then I had a writer buddy at Starbucks and we started talking about story ideas. And then we decided to write a script uh, about three Starbucks employees who killed their least favorite customer. And that was like the first solo script. Not, well, I had his input. We developed the story together, but I wrote the screenplay uh, myself. And that was the first feature that I had written on my own. And I didn't have anything to do with it though after it was done, but it was done, you know, and mm. that's a benchmark for you as a writer mm. to really just produce something. So Portland ended up being the, the, the ground at, at which I, I really started developing a discipline as a writer and realizing that writing was where I wanted to be because I didn't miss performing. I didn't miss being on stage and I didn't really miss being on camera or in front of the camera. Uh, but but putting the ideas down was something that they got more exciting to, and then became necessary to me. Yeah, so so how did you find your way to LA? You know, like, I feel like that to move to Los Angeles is a very purposeful move. So like, what led up to it? And, and how did you do it? Yeah, um, part of it was uh, that one that one buddy who um, the Vietnamese dude, he he was in LA. He after after kind of uh, spending some time in Austin, kind of doing what he was doing, he decided to move out and he started working uh, as a production assistant. Um, coincidentally, for our high school journalism teacher, uh, who is a is a producer now in LA, uh, his name's Rob Thomas, and he did um, Veronica Mars was like his big one of his big he'd done other things beforehand but that i think got, kind of got like the biggest notoriety and had a really good run and so he had gotten a job for rob and rob always remembered us you know and my buddy Viet was a lot better about like making the connections happen and being very good about saying oh hey i want to work for you like mm -hmm. learning how to do that that's a is, skill is a skill and if you don't have it naturally you have to develop it. Mm -hmm. And if you're afraid of it, you're going to stay away from it. Yeah. And that's like, sorry, but it's like what you need to do. Yeah. Like, uh, because like, you know, and r writers tend to be, depends, not all writers, but a lot of writers tend to be intro introspective and mm -hmm. introverted. And they're like, I don't, I don't want to go to this event where other people are going to be. I could stay home. Um, so anyway, he, he, he was good at that. And periodically we, we would reach out and we would we we'd worked on a couple of things together, even at the distance. And then I, I he's like, you should you should come down, you should come down. And by this time, I had met my wife, who at the time we were dating, and uh, we had decided that that we would move in together. But at the same time, I decided I was going to move down to L.A. as well, kind of like right after that. And I ended up coming down to L.A. in two thousand five, two thousand six and crashed on his couch for about six months to kind of test the waters and you know live in Burbank and go visit the production uh, offices and see what I could do and see if my goal at this point was to get a job as like a writer's assistant because that that's just one of the stalwart tracks as to getting yourself in to a writer's mm -hmm. room and um, they had somebody in that position was kind of on the fence about if if he was going to stay or not and then I think the show like you know, like it always happens, like somebody offers you a gig or there's an opportunity and then the show gets canceled or an executive makes the decision. And so I think what ended up happening was the, the show ended up, the show ended up not coming back. And then also I felt weird about being in LA. I felt like, you know, this, maybe this place isn't for me. Like I don't, and I think I was daunted. I was afraid of it. And I didn't, I didn't know if I could try. I didn't know if I could try. I, I didn't know if there was just, maybe too many unknowns and my wife and I yet to be wife, you know, fiance, I guess at the time uh, we were living um, long distance. And for that six months only saw each other a couple of times. And we ended up getting married 
in Vegas. We eloped in Vegas during that period. And then she actually went back to Portland for a while. And then the plan was for us to, for her to move down to Los Angeles. And she had grown up actually in Orange County until she was about 12 years old and then moved to Minnesota. Um, but um, she was okay with the idea of coming to LA, but also she didn't like have her heart set on it either. It was not like, okay, let's mm-hmm. do this. It's just like, let's, let's get married and let's do our thing. And she knew that, that I should write. But, you know, LA isn't the only place where people write. Uh, now, if you want to be in the television industry, then yeah, it's pretty much where you need to be. Film depends on what kind of movies you want to make. Um, so we ended up, we got married and, and I, I didn't feel comfortable being in Los Angeles anymore. And so we, we actually moved to Austin for about a year and then ended up moving back to Portland for a couple more years. Uh, and by that time, had a kid, you know. So then we had we had this baby come into our lives um, and we're starting our family. And like I had to get a job at um, call center for uh, the electric company there because it was very stable and had wonderful insurance. Prior to that, I was I was managing a comic book store, which should have been much cooler than it was, but it wasn't. It was actually kind of a bummer. And so like just that that life started, the family life started. Yeah. And it was it became super apparent to me how serious that is, even if it's fun sometimes, even if I mean, even if it's sleepless at other times. And it just further meant that if I wanted to do this, if I wanted, if I even wanted, not, it wasn't about, it wasn't even about like, if you want to write and be successful, it's like, if you want to write at all, you have to be regimented about it. You have to find time in your day to do that. One of the relationships that I had met the first time around in, um, in LA was uh, this guy named Mike, who ended up being my writing partner for about five or six years. And even though we were long distance and I was in Portland, he and I started writing uh, spec pilots together. And he, because he worked in the industry as a script um, coordinator, I believe, whichever one is in the office that works with the writing and production staff, not the one on set. And um, he, um, you know, went to film school and he knew a lot of these mechanics and worked with writers. And the deal was, is that we were going to write these scripts and just get better at it and get reads. And then, you know, one day magically we'll get staffed. And it worked for me because it's like, hey, I'm in Portland. I've got my family going. I've got my day job. I've got my Brazilian breakdance fighting, like, but I'm still, I'm still writing and, and developing this discipline and kind of learning what it's like to construct within a format and be disciplined about it. And even further, I started, um, for a couple of years, there's this thing called NaNoWriMo National Write a Novel Month in November, where you're supposed to write 50,000 words in a month. And uh, I did that twice. And it, and it did, it, and I have two death story novels that will never see the light of day because they're drivel, you know. And uh, the second one's not as bad. The, second, the first one's terrible. Um, but, uh, but they're done, you know. And it sort of demystified that, like, like, if somebody tells you, I need you to wake up and do 100 push-ups every day, it's like, that sounds terrible. I'm not going to do it. But then if you start doing it, then you're like, okay, I guess I can do that. Um, and that's kind of what I likened it to. Um, but, you know, eventually it was like, okay, like, dude, this isn't going to happen. You're not going to get staffed on a television show living in Portland, Oregon, even if you do have a writer's writing partner in, in Los Angeles. Like, eventually you need to bite the bullet. You need to come down. And to make that choice with a, with a wife and child becomes even more serious. Um, and my wife, Ellie, is amazing uh, in so many ways. Uh, one of those ways, one of the many ways in, in which she amazes me is her ability to plan and view like worst case scenario and then form contingencies to combat those worst cases. Like it's one thing to, to just be anxious about something and freak out and say it's not going to work. It's another thing to say, these are the things that are probably going to go wrong. Here's what I think we should do about that. And that's that's just her personality. Um, and so, but but part of that is is her like you know, re- it's good to have a partner that 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 demands honesty from you, not only to them, but who demands you to be honest with yourself. Because one of the things that we do as artists a lot of times, even in our writing, is kind of say, oh, this is good enough, or I believe this, or this this will be fine. When sometimes it's not, and and. And you can build this whole sort of piece on this premise that that might be false or that might not ring true for you. So uh, it took a lot of planning. It took a lot of seriousness. It took a lot of like discussions back and forth. And, um, you know, there was some family dynamics that kind of made it a little bit of a challenge too. But what ended up happening was um, 
in 2012, in the early part of 2012, I ended up coming down first and staying on my buddy's couch so that I could get a job, a day job. Like I had to get a regular day job that I still work to this day. I work for one of the public utilities uh, here in Los Angeles, a very stable structure. And right now during the pandemic, it's wonderful that I still have my regular day job that I just from home because my child needs insurance, my family needs insurance, a structure to do that because I'm not 22 years old and I can't live in a house with five roommates and have my part-time barista job and write scripts at 2 a.m. in the morning. Because if you can't do that, go for it. Like if you can do that and that's what you want to do, and you've got the vision on that and you're not 100% sure, but you believe it, do it. You need to do it. Um, but if you're married and you've got a kid and you want to make this happen, it can still happen. You just need to be real about it. You need to talk actual dollars. You need to talk about actual budgets to talk about where your kid's going to go to school. You need to talk about the neighborhoods and what's going to be most viable for you and realistic. You need to talk about your ability to endure traffic and summer and helicopters. And <laughs> no one tells you about the helicopters. No one tells you about the helicopters. No one tells you about the helicopters until you're here. And, um, um, you know, LA is not an easy place. It means it. You have to be serious about it. That And that doesn't mean it's not, there's a lot of beautiful things about LA. I think, uh, you know, I, I, uh, New, New York is one of those places that people will say they love without ever going there. They say, oh, I love New York. I can't wait to go to New York and see New York. And, you know, they, they have this romance of it. And then they'll say, I hate Los Angeles though. LA sucks. And without ever having stepped foot here, you know, and it's, what I what I started saying to people in, about LA is they're like, how is it? And I was like, it's everything you think it is, and like a million things that you've never thought it could be, um, because there are so many so many sides of Los yeah. Angeles, and part of it part of it is just it's vast, it's vast, it's a huge territory, and so there's no way that there can be a a singular um, sort of dynamic through it all. Uh, but nevertheless, there's this um, there's there's a magic to it. You know, warts and all, smog and bad air quality and all. There's there's a there's a there's a magic to it that you know the fact that you can go and eat and and spend time in a place like uh, Point Doom in Malibu and spend like your morning and afternoon there, and then get in the car and brave the ride, and then go to La Azteca, uh and in East in East LA and get your chili relleno burrito, you know, for five dollars and enjoy like a profound burrito experience and then maybe head back up to Northeast LA and, and get your hipster coffee and then maybe go downtown and experience, you know, Grand Central Market and, and the changing face of the city. It's amazing. Like, and I still, I still like never go to the West side, like ever, just cause it's, it's far. And I live in Eagle Rock. Yeah, it's too far. I have fr like when friends move to the, uh, from, I have friends who move to the West side who I see less often than my family in Texas. You know? <laughs> They're just all dead to me. So. Yeah, exactly. It's just like RIP you. Yeah, um, yeah for sure. Um, so um, yeah, moving to LA was a put up or shut up. It was hard and it was difficult. And I, my writing partner and I would meet very regularly. And, and by this time he was working on a show on, at Warner Brothers. And I felt cool because we would meet on Wednesday nights and I would meet on the lot. So I'd have to go through the little gate and then go into his office. And uh, we wrote a bunch of spec pilots that didn't go anywhere, that some of them got read by some people, but never got us any real meetings or anything. Um, but they were instrumental in my developing a sensibility for storytelling and for uh, the way that I like to put comedy into scripts and the way that I like to deal with drama and character. And um, eventually, you know, I ended up getting, we, we, we had got one good meeting with a manager and it seemed really promising. And then that didn't happen, like everything that always happens and then reads and stuff. And, um, but, but in, in the terms of moving forward on it, it, it didn't go. And then he started getting frustrated and I was getting frustrated as well. And then we sort of like broke up and then I was kind of in this lurch. And then my wife's like, okay, we've been here like two years. Like what's going on? Like, like rent's not getting any cheaper. Sky's not getting any clearer. Like oh. it's hard for me in LA. Like, what are we going to do? And I was like, I, I, I don't have the best answer for you, you know, other than I need to keep doing the deep writing and trying and wrote a, a solo feature on my own just to sort of keep working um and then eventually i met 
uh, Laura Summers. Uh, and we were both in a similar sort of situation as far as the doldrums of like, man, things aren't going the way that I want them to go. Um, and she told me this idea she had for a script um, that was rich kids. And she said, do you want to write the script with me? Because I'm going to make this movie. I was like, well, okay, if you're going to, if you're going to make the movie, then I guess I'll write it with you. You know, it was, it was that simple in my head like and i believed her i believed her i knew she was serious because she's um she's a, a strong gentle presence and she's a mom and you know you listen to mothers you need to listen to moms when they talk because they know what's going on and you know she uh, she went to nyu and 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 she actually uh was in austin the same time that i was and we ran in similar circles but we didn't really ever i actually did sound design for a show that she directed and I didn't know that she directed. I found it after the fact. Um, but it was a mutual friend from Austin who told us we should meet up in L.A. Mm. And so um, we did. And we started working on Rich Kids on the script like in 2015. And uh, it was a really great process uh, because it took pla- takes place in Houston, outside the Houston area, this place called Pasadena. And she wanted it to reflect a lot of the kids that she grew up with uh, as a you know, a, a young white girl in a, in a nice house in this neighborhood that had a lot of disparity, that had a lot of like lower middle class, lower class houses and apartments and stuff that, that those were all her friends, though. And so um, she wanted she also wanted some brown in the script, too, I think, to give it some to, to check herself, you know, I think. Mm-hmm. And, and, and the right way, because, because it wasn't so much like, hey, it wasn't a brown washing. It wasn't like, hey, I want a brown person on this. It was the reason she wanted me on is because she had read a couple of scripts that I had written before. And she liked my storytelling sensibility and the way that it dealt with character and, and putting humor in there as well. And then also she wanted a male perspective uh, to go with the female perspective that that we worked with in the script. And we talked a lot about the spectrums of masculinity and femininity. And in, in, in the story, in the script, there's two sets of kids, uh, you know, three boys, three girls, and they really do represent the spectrum of like toxic ma- masculinity to not so masculine of a male, you know, and, and, and how that interplays with the sort of main character vacillating in between. And with the girls, it's the same thing where there's one, one woman who's young woman who's, who's more sexually charged outwardly uh, versus one girl who's very bookish. And then the kind of central female character is um, learning about her sexuality and, and learns how to express that and, and gives consent in a way that I think we don't always see on screen. So there was just a lot of discussion about that and, and kind of really hit to the kind of work that, that I want to do and be known mm-hmm. for. And that's that in, ended up getting made and crowdfunded. We did like 25 grand on two separate crowdfunding campaigns, which at the time, like when Laura said, we're going to crowdfund this, I like inwardly like crushed. It was just like, I don't want to crowdfund. Like, I'm so tired of crowdfunding. I'm so tired of people's things and yeah you know it, it's it, it's it's you know even in 2015 it's been going on for years and it's just like how many of these things have i given to and how many people even pay attention and care uh, but it was also the first time that i went to that well and i was really surprised how supportive people were yeah and how much they wanted this surprises you yeah and 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 i was also afraid of like letting co-workers know about it but when they found out they were like dude dude, we want in on this. Like I, t- I told so-and-so in Project Controls and, you know, they, they, they're going to put in some money at, during lunch. Like, this is great. Like, um, and then like even bosses and stuff when like my boss found out about this kind of work because eventually what ended up happening is we, we made the movie. We got some great people involved in it from like our assistant director and producer, Eddie Rodriguez, uh, Una Lee, our, our DP, uh, Carmen Morrow, our, uh, our editor, Ming Vaz, our, our composer. And, other producing partners who I'm sorry I, I'm leaving out at this time, but a lot of goodwill came into it because they wanted to be part of this project that they thought was important. And we ended up not only making the movie, but then mounting a festival run that lasted uh, over 18 months, I want to say. Uh, we won the New York Latino Film Festival um, Best Drama for that year. And we got really excited because we thought, awesome that means hbo is going to put us on hbo latino and we'll we'll be there and they didn't i don't know why uh and even the festival runners like reached out to them and said hey give this another look we we really like this movie and they passed on it again and i can't it's only speculation as to why i don't know 
I don't know if it's political or not, because that's part of it. This was written before 2016, but the themes of exclusion and gentrification and otherness are really at the core of it. And um, so, um, but that, that the rich kids ended up through a sales agent getting shopped around, went to AFM and eventually got picked up on, on Netflix. And it's still there. It's on Amazon and it's on Netflix. So that's what happened with that. That's what happened in getting to LA. All this time, still working a day job and having mm-hmm. a kid and, you know, worrying about all the things that you do um, yeah. when you have a family. Yeah, and that's sort of why I wanted to talk to you too, just because I talked to a lot of people that are from LA or moved here in their 20s. And I also know a lot of people who are not in their 20s who like, this is something they want to pursue. It's possible. You just have to be intentional about it. And I think when you're younger, um, there's just less of your story that's written, right? There's less of your story that's written. So there's less, you have, uh, when your track record is shorter, you ha- you're going to have less failures and you're going to have less like instances of crushing relationships and financial despair. Maybe, I, I don't want to be presumptive. Yeah. This is general because some people come up really hard and by the time they're 18, they're functionally hardened adults. Um, but um, I think one thing that gets discounted is um, the need to live some life as a writer. Mm. Because you need to get some perspective. You need to have your failures. You need to have your wins. You need to have these instances of living outside of Los Angeles. Um, and it's not, it's not, I wish that I had come here younger. I wish that I had come here, um, but I wasn't ready. And to be quite honest, I don't know that I would have survived. I don't know that I would have because my other option leaving Austin instead of going to Portland was to go to Chicago. And if I'd gone to Chicago, I'd have fell in with a, some improv friends and stuff who got involved with Second City. And I think that I would have ended up bloated and drunk and not in a good way. I'd have eaten a lot of meat and, yeah. and like drank myself silly and, and like just been an unhealthy person that not is necessarily going to equate, equate with yeah. not being successful. But I just, I don't think it would have gone the way that I needed to go. And also I wanted to have family. I wanted to have, I wanted to be married. I wanted to be somebody's partner. I wanted to be somebody's dad. You know, we got this kid, we have a 12 year old now, you know, and, and she's, she's grown up in LA since she was three and a half. So really like she's grown up in LA. Uh, and to me, that's cool, you know, because she's going to say that. I don't know. I don't know that we're going to live here forever. I think what's ended up happening for me, you know, cause at a certain point I said, yeah, I don't know that, I don't know that getting staffed on a television show is, is what I need. I don't know. That's what I really want. Because I think the plan ideally in the back of my head that I didn't always verbalize was like, well, get on a show, do this, get in a room so that you can like get in the guild and then start writing your own features and then make your own features and then kind of break off and be independent. And it's like, well, I've already done that. Like I'm already independent. I already Mm -hmm. like, like in, in as writers and as people who, who come to places with plans and feel like we need to have boxes tick so that we can consider ourselves successful at one point i said well well what the hell did i do i moved to la and i got this motion picture i got it distributed and we won a couple awards for it we got the festivals going and you have a movie on netflix and that's like always like unfortunately that's like the thing like when you have a feature they're like oh where is it can i watch it like is it on netflix if it's on netflix like that's like is it on tv right Mm -hmm. it's a and it's a yes or no question you know can i stream it somewhere online yes or no um, so the answer was yes to that. So like in a lot of ways, I'm, I'm very proud of the movie and I'm really happy that I, that I've checked that box off for myself, that, that I was part of something that, that got to this point. And then after that, it was like, holy sh- oh boy, like what's going to happen now? Like now what, now what do I do? How do we follow that up? And so I'm working on a couple of things. Laura and I are working on a, on a, on the next collaborative, um, piece for us, uh, that, follows a woman's odyssey to get her phone back after losing it uh, at a bar one night. Uh, but the setting is a, is a neighborhood undergoing gentrification and she's the white woman in the neighborhood of brown people uh, trying to get this material possession back. And she really has to really become part of the neighborhood that she's been living in for a while and know what that means and come to terms with her privilege and know that with privilege there's a certain amount that you have there's a certain amount you can acknowledge and there's a certain amount that you can't let go and you know sort of to start wrapping up um i do i am always curious about who my guests are fans of so Mm -hmm. who are some of the writers in your life 
either heroes or like friends, peers that you like think we should know about? When I'm, when I'm, uh, I, I did a short film uh, a couple of uh, months ago before the pandemic hit that was about a, a young woman kind of reclaiming some familial identity because I think a lot of times, not just any family, but Latinos have a way of like not telling each other things, like hiding like who your real parents are and stuff like that. <laughs> like, and they just go along with it, you know? And that's just like, no, mijo, we're not going to talk about that. Uh, it's interesting. Um, but I, I wanted to do a story that sort of dealt with something in that arena. And the impetus for it was uh, Gilbert and Jaime uh, Hernandez, the Hernandez brothers, who do this comic called Love and Rockets, mm -hmm. which has actually been around since the 1980s. And uh, I think it's, it's, um, it's graphic novels and it's black and white and I love the art. And they have a whole catalog. They have a whole catalog and they've been independent. And um, since they've worked with, I think, Fantagraphics is their big label, which is kind of niche, you know, the comic world at all. It's not like Marvel or DC. It's a little more uh, to the side, but nevertheless has a big following. And I like a lot of their storytelling. One, because it's not always limited to reality. They do some things that are sort of supernatural. Um, but then they also do things that are very intrinsic into uh, the culture that they grew up with which I think was a very Southern California steeped in punk rock mm. uh, with elements of, uh, you know, w one of the main protagonists um, is, is a lesbian. And like, that's part of the Latino culture that, that I don't think you were seeing in like the 1980s and 1990s, you know, uh, now it's, it's, it's more around. Uh, but I really liked a lot of their storytelling and it was really kind of the basis for, for one of the shorts that I was doing. And so I think th they're, they're one of the names that I don't, here talked about a lot maybe it's because they're comics maybe because they've been around maybe because they don't have any like um film or television mm -hmm. involved with that so uh and then other than that you know a big shout out to laura summers for for working with me on rich kids and all the actors uh who were part of that and uh and crew um and then i know it's cheesy but i think anybody right now who's getting something done anybody who's who's writing um i look up to you know and going to some of like some of the events that you've put together, like meeting like Laura Rivas or uh, other folks who, who are getting their stuff done for themselves mm -hmm. and like making it happen because they want to make it happen. That's how this is going to happen. We talk a lot about changing representation, um, but we don't need to wait for permission to get our stories out there. Uh, we need to do it for ourselves. So anybody who's 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 putting who's putting a script together and sending it to someone for notes like that's such a big deal as a writer uh, that if you can do that i salute you um so where can people find you so like social media wise uh at saldanation uh is my handle on instagram that's also my twitter too uh -huh. uh, and <laughs> if you do enough internet searches i think there'll be even a blog from like the aughts <laughs> You, you like it'll come up and there'll be dust on the screen and you'll have to blow it off. <laughs> I also asked my guests to help title the episode. Mm -hmm. So the prompt is a blank Latinx writer. A Gen Xican American Latinx screenwriter dude. Perfect. <laughs> um, I want to thank you so much for being on the pod. I definitely recommend to the audience to check out Rich Kids on Netflix. I checked it out. I think it's so relevant to our time.